My name is Michael Todd Galloglass. I publish uh, my fiction and nerdy poetry under M. Todd Galloglass and my more mainstream serious poetry under Michael Galloglass. Uh, I am a traditional storyteller, oral storyteller uh, at Renaissance fairs, Celtic festivals, and other similar events. Sometimes I do the show at uh, conventions. That led to my indie book career, and I am also a super, super hardcore academic. I'm in the middle of my third degree. It's my second graduate degree on my way to my PhD because I think Dr. Galloglass sounds really, really cool. And uh, also, if you, I stay in school, they don't collect on my student loans, and it doesn't stand against my credit score. So I'm going to be in school till I die. My, my wife's plan is the same. Um, she loves the uh, learning environment. She loves the college atmosphere. Um, she fully intends to get her PhD. Uh, uh, I expect she will probably also die in school. Um, <laughs> I, 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 so, so funny thing here for the people listening, um, I, my pedigree is completely the opposite. Um, I'm, I'm pretty much a self-taught everything. Uh, I don't have a college degree at all. In fact, I've gone out of my way to avoid being in college because I, I, I dabbled for a few years when my 20s and just hated it and didn't like any of it and ran far away from it, um, uh, much to the chagrin of my wife, uh, <laughs> who is forever trying to tell me to go back and, and get some of those darn pieces of paper that all those darn jobs always seem to want. But anyway, um, my bona fides, uh, let me see if I can share my screen. I haven't tried that yet. Um uh okay i don't know if it shows anything no it probably doesn't i'm just gonna stop sharing anyway um so i am a science fiction writer primarily hard science fiction in places like analog magazine um i also publish novels through bain books mostly traditionally published i've uh, won several awards uh reader's choice awards in analog um, most recently i won the dragon award for best science fiction novel out in atlanta when they were still oh, congratulations. doing congratulations. Yeah, I was very proud of I that. I remember seeing that, but you yeah. know, that was months ago in the yeah, current a long time climate. ago. So Dude, I was um, I, Yeah, I was pretty proud of that. Um uh, especially since uh Larry Niven was the one presenting the award for that category. So oh, uh, Larry, Larry is a hugely influential writer on uh, on on my career and uh, yeah. it was a tremendous honor to accept the trophy from him, so I was very pleased about that. So that's my bona fides. Um to the topic at hand. <laughs> um, I think this is this is really big, and we, Todd and I just came off a panel about indie, and I, I have a hunch we're going to pick up a lot of the same things as we go through this because, it, it, unless Todd disagrees, my opinion of indie publishing especially is you really need to hone in on who your audience is, know what they want, and you need to feed that desire um, as much as possible. Um, Probably more even than I would say trad pub because, uh, again, Todd, you might have uh, a different perspective on it. But it seems to me with with indie authors um, that that is exactly what you're establishing is a is a reliable footprint with a reliable set of readers who know exactly what they want, um, even if it's niche, uh, you know, versus mainstream. And 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 you are the man. You are the person they go to for that kind of story that particular flavor of story maybe it's your universe that you've created that is is just really hitting it out of the park for them um for, for you with the stuff that you've done i mean what, what what's your opinion what do you think you've tried that's worked I, what do you i th i agree with you mostly um and for a l the thing that is weird about me because i had my audience before I started publishing coming from the storytelling, my core, my core community. And I like, I, I really do call them my community. They came up with a name for themselves. Uh, they, the, the, I think it was in 2012, somebody coined the term, the gallo glass army because gallo glass means mercenary in Irish. And so they, um, they so they came up with that name and they built themselves around my storytelling show and my early works and so for my core fan base it's less about uh or it's less about what i'm writing and more about that i'm the guy that's writing it 
I do some really weird experimental stuff that like really nobody, nobody that I've even heard even whispering about doing the, some of the weird stuff that I do, especially the stuff that I post to my Patreon does anything like that. And my, and my readers just gobble it up because they're my readers and I'm the guy that's doing it. Uh, but I do know that there's a, for more, a, a more, a, to use an oxymoron, a more traditional indie author uh, is it's absolutely about figuring out what they want, what what their readers are wanting, and that they kind of, if they're going to jump to another type of story, they've got to sort of pre-program or or sort of lead gently lead their readers into I'm going to be doing this other thing that's different than the thing that brought you to me in the first place. If that, if any of that, I agree with that. Um, it does. It totally makes sense. What you're reminding me of is. Uh, I, I think this happens with science fiction and fantasy especially because sometimes the mainstream writers quotes the mainstream writers, which is a, a big nebulous blob of uh, what we <laughs> might call contemporary literary fiction writers will occasionally dip their toe in and say, oh, you know what? I'm going to do something different. I'm going to write a science fiction book or a fantasy book. And they right. do. Oh, my God. And, and – I, sometimes I think I'm, you can't see me, but I'm face palming right now. <laughs> I, I think they run the risk. So, and I think this is true for romance as well. I think you run the risk of when you do that, of it's really easy to hit a bunch of tripwires with the readership because if they quickly determine, Oh, you don't know this genre, you don't know the tropes, you don't know what you're doing. Uh, you, it, it can end up backfiring. Um, by the same token, um, I would say, you know, in my case in particular, uh, sometimes I feel silly because I, I got into the nichest niche of science fiction you can possibly niche, which is hard science fiction. Hard science fiction is is a very small niche. Now, it, it has a, a, a very select audience as well, which I was part of. That's one thing I would say to people is, is you know, if you're trying to home in on audience, think of what you yourself – are, are the audience of what particular genre or subgenre or sub subgenre do you yourself know best and, and and that you love sometimes i've run into aspiring writers who have this idea that oh you know i actually like uh cozy mysteries but i'm going to try to write thrillers because that's where the money is not that that can't be done but i think sometimes that, that can be a, a project of painful and diminishing returns because people end up writing something they don't like. It's not their speed. It's not their style. They think they have to, to make money, but that would be better served writing something that they genuinely know like intuitively because that's, that's what they read and that's what they love. So when, when I got into science fiction, that's exactly what I did. I stuck pretty much with hard science fiction. I, I deliberately went for the markets that I knew were germane to that interest, which Analog Magazine kind of bills itself as the hard science fiction magazine. Um, and that's what I've done, and that's where I've cut my teeth, and that's where I've dwelled. The problem for me is, is that is such, like I said, it's a niche market. Um, uh, you know, uh, there's there's a huge market outside of that for other kinds of stories and other readers, and I myself, you know, look at that and talking to my wife aka business manager she's always pestering me you know you could do better in some of these other genres and i say yeah you're probably right but again i go back to my trepidation about do i have any business branching off into those genres if i haven't sufficiently read them to be again intuitive about how do i put it about the space that i'm stepping into because again i think sometimes the quotes mainstream literary get into genre and they they think it's going to be easy because they think, oh, it's just genre, and that's I can do that right. in my sleep. And the, and it's like, no, that's that's not how it works. What's what's your thoughts? So coming from coming from the academia, which is where a lot of the 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 quote unquote mainstream literary writers hang out, um, is they they there's mixed feelings. There's a whole lot more acceptance for for genre well-written genre and more and more people are respecting more and more people in academia are respecting uh the what genre writers have been doing for a while and i think that's because it 
academia has been accepting for of more voices across more communities um other than you know the the traditional canon of western literature uh so the thing is and they and when they talk about the coming into our yard there's more and more respect being paid for the traditions of what we're doing especially because uh, a lot of the the literary stuff that they're trying to kind of do the cross literary genre stuff is falling flat in a lot of ways and they're saying oh there's more to this like i and I, i'm not going to i'm not going to throw out names because this is being recorded on the internet and even though they say they're going to take it down what's on the internet is on the internet forever uh within the last couple of years somebody who is a brilliant 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 writer came into genre to write a fantasy novel and it was like the writer had read lord of the rings and game of thrones and decided that the writer could, that writer could write an epic fantasy and do it well and there's so many little bits about it that just irked i couldn't finish the book which was upsetting because i the prose was amazing like but the story and i'm one of those guys that's give me great prose give me great story um i want it all i want i want the best possible story with the best possible prose um so but it's also the same thing is sometimes uh genre writers will try and get a little bit more literary without understanding what that means and what those conventions are. On the other hand, my favorite, my all time favorite novel is a visit from the goon squad by Jennifer Egan, which is absolutely a quiet sociological science fiction novel that won the Pulitzer that explores chaos theory through relate through interpersonal relationships across three generations of characters through the entertainment industry. And it's just amazing. And she's doing some really crazy experimental stuff, both on the soft science fiction side, but also on the literary fiction side. And it took her 10 years to write and it shows and it's brilliant. And like, that's why I love the book, but she doesn't say for her, she doesn't say it's a literary fiction novel or it's a science fiction novel. She says, it's a book I wrote. Right. 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 Yeah. And so the, what, but I want to touch on the, you know, you, you talk about going to um, what you write and then going into another, into another genre and maybe doing well or whatever. It's one of the things I think that writers make the mistake of thinking is like, and I'm one of those guys. It's like, if I'm going to write something and somebody wants it, they better pay me for it. You know, pay me for my work, pay me a fair rate for my work unless I really like you and I'll give you a little bit of a discount, but, um, the, th they think that the, the primary source of what they're working towards is to make the money is to, it's all about the money to them. And so they're chasing genres based the, back to what you were talking about that there, they like cozy mysteries, but they want to write thrillers because that's where the money is. And, and the, the, they think that because they're treating it like a business that they have to make money and to have a truly successful business, the, your mindset needs to be to find and retain loyal customers. And that's your audience. That's your community, Bingo. right? Yep. If you find and retain loyal customers, then you, then the, then the money will come. They will support you. Right. And so if you're writing stuff, chasing markets or genres on some level, that's going to come across as disingenuous. Yeah, I and, agree with that. Right. And so it's not going to re like one of my biggest pet peeves is that people, especially as a storyteller from the story, the oral storytelling tradition, but also as a fiction writer, they say, Oh, so you're a liar. I'm like, no, Lying and storytelling are different things. They're related. But when I'm on the stage, I'm not trying to present anything that I'm saying as fact. The same thing with my fiction, even though I'm like, I'm like, I'm not trying to convince anybody that my fantasy stuff, even my contemporary fantasy stuff, that it's real. Right. And there's absolutely metaphor and I'm making commentary on the human condition and la da 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 da. But I'm not lying. 
I'm not they, like, it's not autobiography. Nobody's going to take anything that I've written and think that it's an autobiography. Right. But it, ha but there's, but a, even though it's a story, whether I'm on the stage or it's on the page, there has to be an honesty to it. Yes. So I'm agreed. writing the stories. I'm writing yeah. the stories that come honestly out of my heart. And let's like, I've, I, I've given up that I'm ever going to win a Hugo. Cause I don't write stuff that <laughs> is like, and that's one of those things. I grew up the Hugo awards, the Nebula awards. I'm never good, but I'm okay with that. Cause Ray Bradbury sure. also never run a Hugo award. So, you know, no, I'm in good true. company. I'm in good company. I, um, I would say the awards, um, I, don't get me wrong. Awards are a great kick in the pants from an ego standpoint. Right. Um, but the awards, boy, uh, they have such limited. Uh, my mentor, Mike Resnick, um, who died uh, not too long ago. Uh, yeah, I, I met Mike. At, yeah, I met Mike once at a Worldcon. He's a great guy. Yeah, Mike. Mike Resnick was an, an amazing man, and he won more awards than just about anybody. And even he was fond of saying, you know what? You step outside the hotel with that thing in your hand, nobody's going to know what the hell it is. Right. Um, and, and he's right. He's, he's exactly right. So, yeah, awards um, have extremely limited traction. Um, and I know so many people who, yeah, th they'll never win anything, but they don't care because they've found that audience. Right. They, they consistently get 10,000 readers on every single book they publish, which – uh, if you're brand new to this, that's phenomenal. If you can even get 5,000 consistent readers. Who I don't have that them. many. And no, right. Exactly. Okay. I don't either. I don't yeah, either. But the thing is, is on the other hand, I have people that reach out to me like, and say, Hey, your book spoke to me. I've had several people like I have, uh, I, one of my Patreon stories that I, I post just on my Patreon uh, at the beginning of the lockdown in, in California, I read over 12 nights at the end of March last year on my Twitch channel. And I had between 20 and 40 people each night watching that. And uh, recently I had somebody message me on Facebook basically saying, hey, that that story helped m me and my daughter get through that hard time. That's my Hugo. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with that. Um, one of my experiences I had was a story I put into um, an indie anthology. Well, I guess it's indie press, really. It was a collaboration anthology. And um, it's something I probably could have sold to Analog if I'd wanted to. Um, uh, but I thought, you know, this this little book had, a, had such a, a cute theme. It was a Christmas anthology. And I really wanted to try the trick of doing a Christmas science fiction story. But one of the things that unexpected to me was, uh, I'm, I'm this is a few years ago, but I'm on deployment. So I'm in the Middle East, which is a <laughs> not very nice place to be, at least when you're on deployment. You don't get to see any nice places when you're on deployment. And uh, I get this email from a gentleman I've never heard of. And he says, I have a treat for you. And I was like, okay, that's nice. And Lo and behold, what he had done is he was a he was a storyteller to grade school kids, and he would just kind of you know pick out different stories he wanted to read to them, and he would read to them every week. Well, I guess, and I don't know how he had found my story in particular, but he found my story in this anthology, and because it was Christmas story, I'd I had aimed it kind of at a at a YA audience with YA protagonists, and he'd read the kids this story. And he said he got such a phenomenal reaction for that, and he passed all of that on to me. And and to me that was gold. That that was pure gold because, oh, yeah. uh, you know, th th I can remember being that age and having stories read to me, and I remember the delight of some of the. I mean, it was a feeling, right? It was a feeling that you had when the story was was hitting you right where it needed to, and so to to learn that that had happened for this classroom of kids was just a a real treat. It, I, I would certainly say it was better than any trophy. Um, I, I was I was extremely humbled by that experience. So yeah, I mean, um, this is so important. I want to I want to express for anybody that's listening that it, it, that love you have as a consumer of fiction um, is so important to try to carry that through to your storytelling. Um, uh, you know, Todd talked about, you know, he writes 
kind of from the heart. And I, I agree with that completely. I agree with you that you, you're putting a piece of yourself on the table when you put that story out there. And, and if you're doing it genuinely, people are going to pick up on that. And, and you don't know who out there that's reading or listening to your story is going to need to hear that that day. Right. Uh, and it and it could it could be some kind of phenomenal thing that you have no idea. You can't predict it, but if you've expressed yourself genuinely and you're you're putting your genuine love for whatever it is that you're creating on the table, that, that's gonna resonate with people. That that really is gonna resonate with people. And at the same time, like you said, Todd, if you're chasing the market exclusively, I think that, that you do. You run a risk of things being disingenuous or appearing disingenuous. Also, I know from experience, it's very tough to bring readers from one subgenre across to another. Um, I, I don't know that there's a heck of a lot of portability because frequently, and I, I'm, I'm going to cite Harry Potter as an example. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. think, <laughs> I think we've all told ourselves, or at least I can remember 20 years ago before I was even publishing, we all told ourselves that Oh, it's going to be amazing! You know, Harry Potter is going to going to gin up this uh, brand new generation of a hundred million readers and or more, and they're all going to be buying us all, and they're all going to be reading us all. And I'm, I don't, I'm not exactly convinced that's happened because my experience talking to those readers who are now mostly adults, but of course now Harry Potter is multi generational, right? Right. The kids, the kids of the of the adults are now picking up what their parents read, just kind of like with Ender's Game, same thing. Right. Um, but they love that thing. They love the Harry Potter universe. Many of them are not interested, or at least in my experience, they're not automatically interested in reading other stuff. They love Harry Potter, just like Star Wars fans love Star Wars. Um, go, go ahead. I think there's, I think there's some truth on both sides of that because, uh, just in a personal anecdote, my kids um grew up uh with the Harry Potter and one of the things we did starting with Prisoner of Azkaban is we started when uh, my ex and I would read them to each other and the kids would listen and uh and then my youngest went from Harry Potter to Percy Jackson and he went then from Percy Jackson to Dresden Files and now my youngest, my daughter, uh, uh, my ex read her the Harry Potter books. And then uh, Megan picked up the Spiderwick Chronicles as now she's learning. She's she's uh, learning to read on her own. And so she picked up the Spiderwick Chronicles. And now she's she's going into the other things. What I think happened is the because YA is still largely a booming market is the Harry Potter people started re start reading Harry Potter as kids, middle grade and young adults. And then they buy more of those and then they become adults and then they have to get jobs. And it's, darn I remember employment. <laughs> what was that? I said, darn pesty employment. <laughs> I know. Right. I mean, I, I am fortunate. I am fortunate enough now that I, that, that, I, I don't have a day job. I supplement my writing income by teaching, but I don't have a day job. So now I, I have plenty of time to read the stuff that I want to do. But when I was working full time and trying to write, oh man, my reading, I just, I had to be really, really choosy and, and pick and choose with what I'm, I was reading. Yeah. So that may be a, that may be a thing is it may, it may have translated into uh, book sales for the YA people because then you know Hunger uh, Hunger Games was huge and Percy Jackson and Artemis Fowl and there was some some crossover there. But then by the time they're in they're in college or uh, or getting jobs, it, it may not. That's where it fizzled out because they and so those of us who are writing more adult oriented fiction don't see the 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 effects of that because by the time they would be getting into oh let me let me think of some more grown up stories uh or more adult oriented stories they don't have the time to to just get lost for a weekend right yeah that's definitely been my experience as so i, I i've got my civilian job which is strictly for paying bills that's the only reason i have it 
Um, <laughs> and then I've, I've got my military job, which truth be told, my, my emotional investment in my military career and my writing career is, is far bigger than it is in my civilian job, uh, mostly because the writing, uh, you know, the writing was the dream going back to when I was a teenager. And I've been fortunate enough uh, that I've managed to succeed, especially in the subgenre I've managed to succeed in, because that was my that, that was my 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 little dream I held close to my heart. All those years I was getting rejection letters and not having any success, and finally I broke in, and, and it's been much better since 2009. I mean, it was uh, many many years from I, I want to say 2000. No, I'm going to go back to the 90s. I'm going to say 93 to 2009 that was that, that was the, the, the drought of no no publications no <laughs> sales no success no money and uh after that things got quite a bit better um but uh, trying to read recreationally the way i did as a young man has been impossible because oh, yeah. i'm too i'm too damn busy so i do i have to be extremely selective that's you nailed it i have to be very picky about what i read because i don't have all the time in the world to read i've started to try to listen to books more but what i've noticed is is i am very sensitive to the quality of the narrator oh um, yeah give, you, give give an example and i won't name names but uh you know, I, I, I tried to listen to a book by one of my favorite authors recently, and I just couldn't do it because the narrator was horrible. They were stilted. They were dry. They had no acting talent that I could detect. Yeah. So there was no there was no inflection. There was no characterization. They were just reading the words on the page in a monotone fashion like this, and it was extremely oh, painful. As, yeah, 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 yeah. And as, I, I, as the guy who does his own or, uh, audio <laughs> books because his, because his audience has said, if uh if you have anybody else do your audiobooks but you we will lynch you uh with the exception of first person female uh protagonist narrators because i'm pretty good but i'm not that good um <laughs> uh, they forgive me for that but no that cringes me i had a similar experience i was listening to the master and commander series oh yeah, uh, yeah. which is just phenomenal the problem is is there's two versions of the whole series and around the third or fourth book, I got, I, I, I misclicked and I got a different narrator and it was like, Oh, they <laughs> he had a completely different take on all the characters. Sure, and yeah. I mean, it wasn't bad, but it was like, no, that's not how captain Aubrey sounds. What? Right. That's not lucky Jack. And so I almost yeah, didn't yeah, finish yeah. it. I got to the next one, I w and then I made sure to get the next uh, narrator, the narrator I liked, who was just amazing. And I was like, "Oh yeah, there's Captain Audrey, Aubrey. There's uh, there's Peter Maturin. There's there's Bondin." So yeah, the the uh, you, the the that's a huge difference in the in in the make or break of an audiobook is yeah. is the narrator and and are they a voice actor? Right. Yeah, that's important. Which is very different than a stage actor. Yes, like, very, it's been, very different. The transition that I've done from doing performing on a stage to perform to reading the audiobooks is like that was that that was a learning curve. Right. Yeah. I I think that's huge. And I, I would say for people that are doing indie projects especially, who will have theoretically more control over who their narrator is yeah um boy if you're doing a series try like heck to get the same person if you if if you like that person if you think they're doing good work and you're getting good feedback from your audience yeah. try to keep try to keep that person because to me that's that's as <clears throat> important maybe even more important than trying to keep your uh you, you know for series people pick up on does it look like the series meaning does right. does the artwork, the lettering on the on the cover, does the composition, does it all look like it, it it's part of a series? And if suddenly you have your narrators bouncing all over the place, different quality, different ability to act. And like you said, voice acting is completely different from stage acting. It's a very, very different tool set, at oh, least yeah. in my observation. Um a uh, bit of a funny story there. So I actually married my first audio narrator. Uh, we've been married for almost 30 years, but you know, one of the things that I loved about her right at the start, uh, was, was her ability to pull off, uh, characters and her ability. I mean, she, she has a, 
what I consider to be a, a beautiful voice anyway, but she can do characters. And some people might have an amazing radio voice, but they can't do a character to save their lives. And with oh, fiction, yeah. that's that's so important. Um, I think of uh, uh, English actor Rob Inglis when he did both The Hobbit and uh, Lord of the Rings. Now, I, I'm, I'm kind of weird, and I might be pissing a few people off by saying this, but I struggle to read Tolkien. In in my opinion, it's a it's a very specific style that is kind of an old English cozy kind of style um, that I I myself don't have an easy time reading on the page. But I can sit and listen to Rob Inglis read me those stories all day long because right. he he does the characterizations, mm -hmm. um, the just his accent even when he's not doing characterizations is is a lovely lovely accent that complements that style of writing in particular, um, you know, you know, if we're talking about niche audiences or trying to yeah. you know, keep an audience, I think that's so important because like you said, they're going to notice immediately if it's a different person and they're going to notice really badly if that person can't pull off the characterizations the way your previous narrator did. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you something about your, your, your dislike of um, Tolkien on the page. You are in good company because <laughs> Sir Terry Pratchett felt the same way. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, interesting. Yeah, no, he, yeah, I didn't know that. Sir Terry Pratchett, he, he, at one point he gave an interview because, because he would tell people they just like Tolkien and he would go, you don't like Tolkien? You're <laughs> British, you write fantasy and you don't like Tolkien? <laughs> Blasphemy. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, uh, it's it's interesting because I I love the world of Middle Earth. You know, that, that, which it's funny saying that because everybody freaking does. But right, I, Middle Earth is endlessly fascinating. Um, I I love being told the stories again. Rob Inglis, I think, um, right, did an amazing job as a narrator, and I can listen to that all day. But to sit down and to try to read The Hobbit or to try to read like Fellowship. I really struggle, and uh, oh, that's interesting about Pratchett. I didn't know that. Huh. So the thing is, is and this is coming from my theater background, and and I did a D, I took a I took a, a philosophy class that studied um the, that was basically studying the Inklings, uh, Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, but also Charles Williams. Uh, but one of the things we found out about that is is the reason Tolkien wrote Lord of the Rings and created Middle Earth is he was create, trying to create a British centric origin story for the British Isles. He was creating an origin myth mm -hmm. uh, because the all of Britain's mythology is borrowed from Celtic and Viking, and he wanted right. to create. And he was he was a linguist, and and that I think that he he really was because he was he loved the sound of language and how language played off of it, it off of itself, and I really think that that's why the much like Shakespeare, you don't I like you shouldn't read Shakespeare. Right. You, yeah. you watch Shakespeare. Shakespeare is performed, and I think that there's yes. some of that because of Tolkien's background as a linguist and a poet rather than a fiction writer. That um, that work. That's why it works so well when somebody who can read well. But I think now we're, we're way off topic. No, I, I think this is still germane, and the reason I think that is 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 because we're we're kind of honing in on as audience you know, our, our we ourselves you know everybody who's a writer starts out right. as a reader and or a listener and or a watcher yeah um, oh yeah it, I, okay yeah and and so i i think you're speaking to why do people love a thing for what it is mm -hmm. is it the is it is it is it the world like i often think with with lord of the rings a, a great deal of what holds his audience across generations is the immersive depth of it all. He puts so much time and effort into building the languages and building the backstories mm -hmm. for all the, the separate races and, and, and the, like you said, the mythology of it, um, that, that it's just engrossing and people can just dive into that and dive into that and dive into it. Um, I don't, I personally, and again, this is heresy depending on who you say it in front of, <laughs> I personally don't think Tolkien is that practice of a storyteller by modern standards. Um, oh. I, I think he's an incomparable world builder, and I think that's that is where he gets people. 
It, it, that, that's just my opinion. That is a that is a from the hip opinion. So I'm gonna okay, let me put my academic hat on. Okay. So uh, and you are abs- like uh, pe- I hear all the time. Oh, this person wouldn't be published today, or this person wouldn't be published today. And very honestly, yes, they wouldn't be published today. It m- almost certainly. The thing though is, n- we like especially the novel the novel is such a baby art form i mean it's we're barely past as as novelists we're barely past i mean maybe we're we're pre-teens at this point if that uh going to poetry the oldest poetry we have on the planet is six thousand years old uh and Poets have looked at poetry and re-examined and re-examined poetry and experimented with poetry all over the place because one, it's a, such a shorter medium. Fiction is so new, especially fiction on on this, is that yes, the fiction that was told in even the mid or mid late twentieth century isn't going to necessarily hold up as well, except for the super master craftsmen. Uh, because we're just now getting into the deep dive, really like the, the, the thing that I like to do, the super nerdy let, okay, let me take what this writer did in this sentence and figure out, okay, let me super deconstruct this to figure out what they did, how they did it, why it affected me the way it did. And then how can I replicate it? Not as they did it, but how can I take that and replicate it in such a way that I can use that technique honestly, again, honestly, not to just do the thing in my own fiction. Um, we're just getting into that kind of conversation on an almost scientific basis within the, not just the academic community, but also those people that are, like have the deep love of the exploration of fiction. So I think in the next 20 to 30 years, especially with the technology that we've got for being able to play with, you know, font sizes and, and everything fiction is going to be, we're in the middle of this Renaissance of what is possible in written storytelling because I think we're going to be looking at it much more as a written thing rather than as a spoken thing, which we're still, we're still trapped in that and we're not necessarily trapped in that, but we're breaking free of that. And I think that it's just a super exciting time for what's going to come out of what's going to come out of the imagination of people who are looking at fiction deeply and studying it as its own thing. Right. No, you're you're probably right because the novel as we know it in 2021 really didn't exist before probably about 150 years ago. Um, I mean, even right. Well, we have Shelley and we have Jane Austen and we have those romantics, and then we have Charles Dickens, and Charles right. Dickens yeah. is the dude that re- he was the Shakespeare of the novel. He sure like he's the guy. He's the guy that made that happen. And then, and then I believe it's shortly after that we had Mark Twain, right? Yep. Right. Two different guys, two different continents writing two completely different kinds of things, totally reshaping what we thought about mm-hmm. when it comes to written stories. And then, uh, and then what we had, and then the, the, the next big explosion from that was uh for what was possible with the written word word was the arguments uh stylistically with um uh Faulkner and uh Hemingway right and how they changed how we did it how we looked at things and then Tolkien's one of those guys because then it was like oh 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 you know uh Tolkien and the other inklings really changed things up but on the other hand, on the other side here in the United States, we had Robert Howard, Edgar Rice Burroughs. I think Burroughs was American, right? You know, I can't remember. I don't know. I, I, we had, say, we had Robert remember. E. Howard. We had, you know, we had the we had the pulp writers, mm-hmm. and and that really kind of changed things. And um, and so I mean, I could go down because this is this is my this is my huge this rabbit is my hole, yeah. Jam. Big rabbit hole, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, but um, but so it's we. I really think 
I, I really, really think that we are somebody somewhere is going to, in the next 10 to 15 years is going to come along and is going to change, uh, change how we think of English in the written word, the way <clears throat> Charles Dickens did and the way um, Mark Twain did and the way Faulkner and Hemingway did, somebody's going to break us and it's going to shatter water. everything. Um, oh, um, I think Jennifer Egan, as I, as I raved about goon squad earlier, was that in this one? I can't remember. doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, so my, my all time favorite novel visit from, yeah, because I was talking about the genre bending literary stuff. Uh, Jennifer Egan does a really, really bold thing, a slight spoiler alert. There's a large section of it. She tells it in every section is either in a different tense or a different POV. Um, so she does third person, first person, uh, sec there's a one in second person. She has past tense, present tense of, in some cases she goes into future tense. Well, one of the perspectives she tells the story in is in a PowerPoint presentation later in the book. But because she laid the foundation for what she was doing, when I read the PowerPoint presentation section, it, uh, uh, I could vis viscerally experience what was going on with those characters being talked about in the PowerPoint presentation is brilliant. It's amazing. It's daring. And I think that that, that is going to be sort of a catalyst stepping stone that is going to spark somebody to do something really amazing or something like that. There's all sorts of crazy stuff going sure, on. Sure. Uh, like I, uh, I started a new book project. Well, I started the next step of a new book project today. This last year, over this last year, I wrote a series of letters to somebody and I kept the copies of them and I made, I've spent the last couple of days um, and I hand wrote them. I spent the last couple of days photocopying them and I put them in one of those accordion cardboard accordion folders. I made two copies. I buried one under the wood pile and I buried one about two and a half feet down in the ground. And a year from today, I'm going to dig them up and I'm going to make a book of poetry based on what's left. Oh, interesting. Interesting idea. Because I'm yeah. just like, why sure. the heck not? Right. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm, like I'm, I don't want to do this stuff that other people have done before. So that's one of the thing, you know? So, and I think that because we're seeing, we've gotten all the traditional, <laughs> we've gotten all the traditional, types of storytelling out of the way and th there's going to be people who want those kind of stories but there's right. also writers like me who are super weird that's like how can i what can i do that's different that nobody sure, that i've sure. never heard of before yeah. and why not try it because that's the thing you know right one of the things um, oh we're almost out of time um, um we'll, we'll see if we can get to at least one or two questions if there are any questions but one thing you're reminding me of is one of the lessons i learned about a dozen years ago from um, one of my workshops out in uh, Lincoln City with uh, Christine Catherine Rush and her husband was mm -hmm. um, it, it is extremely difficult to stand out on content or subject and where you will stand out is your voice and what they meant by voice was your specific style of word combination how you write dialogue because your dialogue expresses your characters how they sound to you Mm -hmm. uh, all these different, all these different things that would organically come out in your writing, and they would, they would resonate with some readers, and they would not resonate with other readers, and that's how you differentiate it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I sometimes think that's very true, and so I've, I've taken to telling um, new authors, especially who aren't terribly experienced, that they need to give themselves room to find that voice, uh, to find that comfort zone of how the prose is created, their word choices, um, their choices of analogies, metaphors, again, how they do the dialogue. Sometimes I think that's that's really important, especially with quotes, traditional novel style, which is really a, a specific kind of way of telling a story that people expect when they pick up a, a paperback. Um, let's, uh, producer, do we have any questions? I, I can't see a text box. Do we have any questions from the peanut gallery? We do have one question from Emma okay. Preston Hankins. 
Hi, Emma. I know you. What's the question? And she asks, how do I create a persistent brand and an audience when my writing is all over the place? Um, boy, we've talked to Todd and I have gone all over the, we've, we've really ranged all over the place on this one. Um, again, I think for me anyway, what's worked for me has been, I've stuck with what I fell in love with when I was young, which, um, uh, you know, hard science fiction really hit a big chord with me when I was an older teenager. Um, I fell so hardly in love with it, uh, that I just, it's what I esteemed to do. So I, you know, maybe go back and look at the things that you loved when you were younger and, and try to say, okay, what was the number one thing that just set your heart on fire or set your imagination on fire and, 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 and focus on that for a while. Um, don't worry about the market. Don't worry about uh, chasing the money. Don't worry about thinking you have to, you know, somehow anticipate trends or any of that stuff. Go back to what you lo really love, like your number one kind of story that you just can never get enough of, and, and and focus on that. Make that your focus. What's your opinion, Todd? Uh, I say do the thing that you love. I agree with that. But the other thing, I'm gonna I'm gonna go a little bit of of, of away from that i say read stuff outside of what you love because that's going to bring new ideas you're gonna those those things will click in ways that other writers aren't doing stuff um that so you'll have these you'll be making connections which is one of the things that I like to do is I like to do these weird genre bending things where it's like, I'm going to take this thing and this thing, Brandon Sanderson does that too, but very differently than I do, which, you know, if he, if Brandon does it, I mean, he sold a few books here and there. Uh, so read those, but I'd say, just a few, just a yeah, few. I'd say experiment also play around with it. Enjoy it. Like if you get this weird idea or if you hear somebody say, Hey, you can't do that in writing. Anytime I hear somebody say, Oh, you can't do that in a story. I go, okay, I'm going to write a story that does that and try and pull it off. Um, be daring and bold and just read great, great, great books. Great, great books. The the best books that you can find. And and really kind of th what, what are those writers doing? And even if you don't deconstruct them at the level that I do, you're going to get a bunch of that through osmosis. Samuel R. Delany said, and this is one of my favorite quotes by any writer an anywhere about a writing education is, uh, you are hard pressed to write a better book than the best book that you've read in the last six to 12 months. And, and so, you know, I'm continually in school, so I'm always being forced to read really great, interesting, provocative stuff. So that's what I'd say. And read great books and experiment and play around and don't worry about your quote, quote unquote brand. The great writers that are brands uh, didn't start out trying to be a brand like Stephen no, King. Didn't none of start them did. out, what was that? I, I, I say, I agree with that hundred percent. None of them did. Right. Yeah. Stephen King is Stephen King because he wrote the stuff that he was interested in. Neil Gaiman writes the stuff that he's interested in. Brandon Sanderson is just like, I like magic systems. And now he's, Brandon Sanderson, right? So, yeah. Okay. I, I think that brings us to the end of it. Uh, Todd, thank you very much for joining Impromptu. I think it's oh, been a great conversation. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. This was a, a, a huge compliment, and this was a lot of fun. I had a great time. I, I agree, and learned a lot, and hopefully the listeners did too. And uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And uh, for uh, this LTE, um, I hope we can see everybody in person next year.